Well, hey, everybody. My name is Bill Selleck. Welcome. It's good to see you, except I'm not actually seeing you, but you're seeing me. It's great to be here. Um, we're going to talk about tech teams. So first, a little bit about me, um, and then we're going to jump into some systems. So my name is Bill Selleck. Pronouns are he, him. I'm the director of technology at Hillbrook School, or an independent K-8 school uh, in Los Gatos, near this like San Jose-ish area. Um, this is my eighth year at Hillbrook. And so I'm really excited to be talking with you about how, think about kind of the systems of a tech team and how we staff that and how that's changed over time. Um, and it sounds a little bit dry, but it's gonna be good. And I'm pretty excited about what we're doing here at Hillbrook uh, in our tech department. So um, typically what you're gonna get with technology is you have you know all these different roles, kind of different hats, right? So when I first started at Hillbrook, it looked something like this. Right, Emily was over at our help desk. Uh, we had a, a third party, Novani, and Aaron was our network guy, so all the system administration was there. Um, Kelly was our tech coach and, and working, you know, one on one with teachers in classrooms. And then I was our tech director on you know, the senior leadership team, doing all the the admin -y stuff. If we get rid of what that looks like with the actual humans I was working with, that's probably less exciting for you. Although, like, we were so young. Very generally something like this right like if you're going to run technology at a school there are these different roles or kind of different hats one of them is technically a hat one of them is like a little football i didn't know how to do a coach hopefully that makes sense to you right so we're going to see these kind of icons as we go along uh, but these are kind of different roles and typically what happens is you have one person per role and they stay in their lane right? they have their job description and they do that and that's that's kind of it right um, and we had a, a philosophy around how we support devices, how we support people at Hillbrook. And that actually led to us kind of reframing how our own roles within the tech department work. So when we think about technology at Hillbrook, we think about people, not devices, right? We're supporting the person. So my job is not to wake up, drive to Hillbrook, and support the iPad. My job is to wake up, drive to Hillbrook, and support teachers, students, staff, admin, parents, right? All the people. Uh, and I think it's so often it's when, when you see that stack of iPads kind of waiting for you to, to do something with, right? It's, it's easy to fall into the, I'm going to work on these devices, right? But I think that that really simple shift away from supporting devices to supporting people really can transform a tech department, right? It's such a simple, subtle change but it makes a profound difference, at least it has in our tech department. And so as we look at what a tech team looks like, an interesting question I think is actually what matters to you. So a fellow administrator at Hillbrook, her name's Annie Makla, she's the founding director of the Scott Center for Social Entrepreneurship. Um, and social entrepreneurship, you're, you're just like, whoa, those are a lot of nouns, right? Social entrepreneurship asks students and educators two questions. What matters to you and what are you doing about it? And so I took this idea of people, not devices, right? This is how we support all the people in our community and the idea of what matters to you and started kind of reframing how we actually staff different tasks at Hillbrook, right? So if you look at just me, Right, a big thing that I care about is when we have these devices, the students aren't using them just as as like digital worksheets, right? Maybe a little bit, but you know, fundamentally, we're not spending all this time and effort and money to take a paper worksheet and put it on a device. It's not that's not exciting. Um, I don't think it's exciting when I was a teacher. I don't think it's exciting for students. It certainly wasn't exciting for my students just to kind of sit there and do worksheets, whether it's analog or digital, right? So I think fundamentally, once we have these devices, you know, we're able to do these extraordinary things with them, right? It's not just an iPad, right? Depending on the context, an entire recording studio, right? You could re like record your own music on this. Like that's, that's so, so cool and so powerful. Um, and so I think that these Apple devices, you know, part of why we're a one-to-one -one Apple school is that there's a bias towards creation and away from just consumption, which is kind of the standard thing that, that I grew up in doing for school, right? A second big thing that matters to me is giving our students and our teachers agency 
over what they do and how they do it. And again, I think Apple devices do such a great job of supporting initiatives like this because you can create kind of anything, right? And it doesn't matter actually if it's a teacher we're talking about or a student, you know, like it, it's more just opening your mind to the possibilities and then allowing yourself to do them. Or if you're a student, you know, working with the teacher to, to make sure that you can do the thing. Um, and that last bullet point, it, it I don't know quite how to describe this. So I'm gonna just lay it out for you, creative rigor. Um, so my undergrad was in music. And the big reason I did that is because I wanted to be able to record my own music. And back in, as my kids call it, the 1900s, it was like the late 90s, but it was still, it was, they're right, it was the 1900s. Back in the 1900s, if you wanted to record a full band, you had either pay a lot of money to get into a studio, get signed by a record label, and then they would pay a lot of money for you to be in a studio, or you would work in a studio. And I thought, like, I have the best chance of doing option number three is, is just working in the studio. And so I did that, um, got a music degree, studied audio engineering, um, interned at Orange Whip Recording Studios in Santa Barbara. So if you're a punk rock person, like, you may know that studio. It was a really big deal back in the day. Um, and I found that kind of the stereotypes you have about musicians and certainly kind of punk rock musicians um, didn't align at all with how they actually behaved in the studio. These were some of the most serious humans I have ever met. And they're also the kind of people like on stage are like jump roping with a mic cable and like, you know, not smashing guitars. That feels like, I don't know, stereotypical, like early nineties, but like doing crazy stuff on stage. Right. Um, and so that's what I used to think being a musician was. And when I actually saw them in a studio recording. They were so serious, so focused. They had their plans. They had everything laid out. And my goodness, when we got to work, like we got to work. And so I think we can apply so much of this to what learning is with our students. And for us, as um, as people that are, I don't, I'm assuming if you're listening to this, you're on the tech team in some way, right? As we support teachers so that they can do stuff like this for students, um, I think there's this really interesting space that we can start to play in where it's not just let's record music for fun, let's make a movie for fun, let's paint a thing for fun, let's draw a thing for fun. But these aren't just like fluff things, um, but you can really like deeply have rigor and have like this academic experience through these creative arts, right? And so that that shouldn't be a separate thing from who I am as tech director and the hat I wear, right? That should be actually part of how the tech team runs and part of how I spend my time. What I found is whomever is on the tech team or whoever we need to to hire or be you know, like a contractor with us, um, they can fill in the spaces where either we don't have the expertise or where their expertise is much better than ours, um, or I guess just faster than us, or um, we just bring them in to help with some of the work so we can do some of the other things. And so I encourage you to really think actually what matters to you and then as much as you're able to, as much agency as you have structured your time or your department or, you know, like try and just take that agency and, and run with it so that you're able to do more of what matters to you in your job. Um, and we, we've been able to, to really do this in a pretty amazing way at Hillbrook. And it's really not that complicated. It was just kind of a, a reframing of things, right? So the way it looked is everybody, you know, really still has their roles and their expertise and certainly with the job descriptions, these are the things you have to do, right? But really, if we just put all of our skills and interests in kind of one bucket, we can look at the different tasks we have, the different platforms or workflows we have, and then maybe the one person takes it, right? If it's a broken iPad, it's probably gonna be the help desk person that fixes it, but it doesn't have to be, right? Because we're all just in this department and I think once you allow for some flexibility with pursuing things that matter to you, um, you know, there's a bit more give and take. So some examples, some platforms, and then how we actually use those, All right? So we use Zendesk for our ticketing system. We've been doing that for about a year and a half now and um, cannot recommend it enough. It's just the, the ability for us to efficiently um, 
take over tech tickets is just so, so great. Uh, one of my favorite parts about this, I'm gonna explain this as though you don't know much about Zendesk. You know, so you have the ticket in kind of the main window and then over in the sidebar you have, um, you know, who it's assigned to. And so you can set it up by default, it's going to whomever is your help desk person. Or if you have several of them, you know, it might be based on a keyword in that or on a sender, you know, it can automatically go to certain people. Um, or you can just say like, all right, your job is to always be on Zendesk. You're responsible for 100% of the tickets. But you don't have to do it that way. And so part of, if I, if I rewind like four years and look at our tech team, uh, like in 2017, um, so Emily was our help desk person. So traditionally she would have been the one to take all of our tickets. She wanted to be able to do some more music. We talked about her teaching an elective and she ended up doing an amazing um, digital music elective. But to create time with that, I had to take on more of the tickets, right? And so what I'm able to do is I could open up Zendesk, even though like we're doing a little back to the future moment, because we're talking about four years ago, and we've only been using Zendesk for just under two, but that's okay, you're, you're with me. No, you are. All right, cool. Uh, I can just click the words ticket. It. Tickets are automatically assigned to me. And then I can take that off of her plate so that she's able to, to pursue more ways. Um, and I think when you're able to, to bring your whole self to the job and really work on um, what matters to you in your workday, um, I think you're happier as a human. And I think you actually have a, a more successful tech team, you know, fire on all cylinders. That's a tech team reference. It's also a car reference. Another example, very simple website. You can even do this in a Google form if you want to build one of your own. Um, we have a little button that we push through Jamf onto um, every iPad. Every employee, every student has a little black and white icon with a wrench, says my iPad fix. You open it up, it goes to a website, myipadfix.com, creatively titled. And you're able to troubleshoot your own iPad. Zendesk has a few different ways you can kind of do this. Um, you know, you could emulate this in a, a Google form pretty simply. The idea is it's basically a decision tree, right? So if you click on power, it's going to give you some troubleshooting steps for that. The idea is that people don't have to rely on the tech team to actually get the device fixed, right? So part of it could be seen as a little bit selfish, right? The tech team doesn't need to help you, but it's really just about I think two things, making a tech department more efficient and making um, your end user, your student, parent, employee, faculty, um, really having them take ownership over their devices and their experience. Uh, it also, like if they're able to troubleshoot it very quickly in my iPad fix, they're gonna get that solved in less than a minute, um, which feels really good for the person that needs the thing fixed. The biggest thing I would say, no surprise here, is by using Jamf. Uh, when I came in, uh, you know, seven and a half years ago to Hillbrook, we were using a variety of different ways, including nothing to manage devices. Some of them were just 100% hands-on and uh, and no digital way to manage them at all. It just needs to be in front of us. Um, pretty quickly, you know, within about two years, we had everything in Jamf. Uh, at this point now, you know, year eight for me at Hillbrook, um, we have every Apple TV, every iPad every computer is in Jamf. And for us, that really just makes us more efficient, right? We can create all those policies, push those out, and then boom, something's updated, something's installed, something's fixed. It's it's extraordinary. Um, I'm assuming I don't need to, to stand too much on a soapbox to talk about the, the great things that Jamf is and allows us to do. But I think in the context of this, um, our just our ability to manage, you know, at this point, like the Hillbrook employs two full-time people in the tech department, and I am one of them. So if we have a thousand devices and two people, right, you have to be efficient with that if you want um, to not, you know, curl up in the corner of the room and, and gently sob. Um, and that's not been happening for us. It's been great so far on most days. <laughs> uh, one thing we've been doing uh, is actually just building a very simple Google site, right? Like I have my own website and have built a bunch of websites. I've taught a web design class, but if you just need to get content like on a public place, it's pretty hard to beat the efficiency, the simplicity, the clean look of a Google site. And if you're a Google workspace for education school, 
you already have access to it. My favorite example of this is actually the new employee orientation. So we have three days where new employees are onboarded in early August. There's a lot, a lot to cover, right? So it used to be half of those, one of those days, like four hours was with the tech team, setting up your device, logging into all the things, like just slide after slide, clicking and clicking and clicking, um, and found that people, like, what do you think? How much did they actually pick up on? 10% was my guess that they actually remembered. Um, I mean, also as a task, like add a profile picture to your Google account, they could do that. Um, but really, like what does technology do that humans can't do as well? If we put it on a website, new employees can access it anytime, any place. And I think most importantly, this part's often overlooked at any pace. If I'm up in front of a, a new employee group, click and click and click and do this, this, and this, and you're the one person that just didn't get it, you might raise your hand once and say, can you walk us through that again? Sure, let me do it again. You, if you're particularly bold or kind of unaware of, of social interactions, you might skip a second time, right? And be like, can you do that a second time? One more, please. And then you just, you kind of give up, right? But if we have a video walking through a new platform and there's like 20 platforms you have to be responsible for by the first day of school, you can rewatch me doing a thing 30 times. And that's totally fine, right? Like it's not to be like underestimated the power of putting a video tutorial on a simple site. It has completely transformed our ability to build teacher capacity for learning all the platforms. And it's also really had them just own their own learning and also made it so we don't have to repeat ourselves a whole bunch. I do that enough at home with my own kids, which is okay. Maybe I'll make them a Google site. Oh my gosh, that's so obvious now, isn't it? All right, make a video for like bedtime routine or a page, a page for morning routines. It's on, thank you, thank you. Who said that idea? Whoever it was, thank you. That's funny in my head. Um, I wanna break this down, not looking necessarily about um, different kind of platforms, but looking at the ISTE standards for administrators. Um, and when I say that, I'm just like cringing at how dull that sounds. But I promise this is actually like a pretty interesting way to look at what a tech department does, why they do it, how they do that, and then um, is an interesting way to actually take some of roles and responsibilities and organize it. Um, it was one of those where really I looked at uh, at this first big category, visionary leadership, and a lot of what the ISSI standards for leaders looks at is modeling, right? So if you want students to have some agency and actually be able to choose like how they demonstrate their learning, guess what you need to do with your teachers if you're an admin? Same thing, right? Give them some agency over how they learn and how they demonstrate their learning. Absolutely. So for us, um, I would actually put Jamf in this bucket. Um, once you learn kind of the basics of, of managing devices in Jamf, there's a decent amount of creativity as to how, um, how you organize devices, how you push out policies, apps, um, how you keep track of stuff. It's, um, it can be like a, a surprisingly, for me, creative space that, um, yeah. Have you thought about that way? I recently have, and it, I like it. Um, we're an Apple Distinguished School here at Hillbrook School. We have been for nine years now. And um, I think a lot of that is just us really putting a stake in the ground saying, you know, using Apple devices in innovative ways is a key part of who we are at Hillbrook. Um, and, and certainly Jamf helps us to do that in, um, in an efficient, creative way. Um, the last thing, and, and Emily, who you saw that picture of earlier in some slides, uh, had worked at an Apple store before doing um, Genius Support. And she taught me, and I could not recommend doing this strongly enough, the three A's of support, um, where you you can read it along with me, but I'll still say it. Acknowledge, align, and assure. Right, so the acknowledge is really, um, you know, wait, is it align? I think those are the three. I feel like ask is one of those. Is it four A's? I'm second guessing everything right now. Uh, but the idea is that you're not just saying like, let me fix the thing, you're wrong. You know, it's really like clarifying and asking like what the issue actually is. Alignment is saying, yeah, like that can be pretty frustrating. Yeah, that happened to me. 
um, you know, acknowledging is, is really just kind of restating what happens. You know, it sounds to me like you're having problems getting this printer to print using Google Chrome. Yes, right. So that we're on the same page as to what the actual issue is. Um, and all of that, again, it, it sounds um, pretty, you know, kind of nuts and bolts in the weeds, whatever your metaphor might be. But just really taking that moment when you are first talking with somebody that needs some support uh, to make sure that they feel heard and that you're actually hearing what the issue really is uh, has made a really big difference and really um, is a big part of what I think the culture is of the tech department at Hillbrook. The next big bucket, and again, we're going just directly with these ISTE standards for administrators, is teaching, learning, and assessments. So with this, I already talked a little bit about it. You're going to see this again and again as we go through the, the standards, is um, actually modeling the behavior I want faculty to do with students, so how I interact with them. And so if I don't want teachers to stand up and lecture for 40 minutes straight, I should never do that with faculty. So as much as possible for my own behavior and also as an admin team to, to try and kind of keep that in check so that we're not just sit down, be silent for 45 minutes while we talk at you, right? Like that, we know that's not how students learn. We also know that's not how teachers and employees learn. So trying to model the desired behavior, but that also works not just for like <laughs> poor talking. And, and by the way, like it's not lost on me that I am now talking and you, we've done no interactions also video, right? Like, yes, there's some irony in this moment. I'm just like, I'll take that in. All right, but that's okay, right? So this is actually another way that we can learn. Um, watching videos is, is absolutely a, a great way to learn, um, just not the only way. If we were doing this in person, this would be a really bad presentation. Um, and really just presenting faculty with choices so that looks um, like a number of different ways. At our beginning of the year um, employee retreat, I had, uh, it was about two hours of time to lead some professional learning. And I wanted choice to be a key part of that for our employees because I want choice to be a key part of the student experience. So we did an unconference, if you're familiar with ed camps, an ed camp is a type of unconference where we just had some blank poster boards, stick them on the walls, what do you want to talk about? You don't have to be the expert, just what conversation are you willing to lead? Uh, it could be something, you know, pretty intense. You know, some some people ended up talking about some specific books. Some talked about a pretty broad category like diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I saw that most things were covered. Um, and actually what I was curious about was talking about Ted Lasso. So that's what I put for one of my sessions. And we actually had a great half hour conversation about the TV show Ted Lasso. It's just... So good. So, so good. Um, so even as I lead, uh, what you would imagine would be, you know, let's spend two hours learning the Clips app. Let's jump into advanced keynote. Um, no, right? Building that faculty choice into faculty professional development when it's something that I get to be responsible for. And then really, um, this last kind of bucket, I think, that fits in this last standard is not specifying every single step along the way for teachers. Um, that if there is like a really specific way that you know, like Seesaw comes to mind, right? So for that assessment or for that uh, kind of portfolio tool, there are certain ways that you need to create an assignment and add them to specific folders. So for that, it's follow the system, but I'm not gonna say you have to use it this way every time. But let's all click on the same thing at the same time. Not interested in that. I don't think teachers are interested in that. Um, the next big thing, we're going to go pretty quickly through this slide, is looking at digital age learning environments, right? So at Hillbrook, what does that look like? One-to-one -one iPads for every student, K-8. For us, it's technically junior kindergarten, JK-8. Um, everybody has a device. We also have just about one MacBook Air cart per building, right? So if you need to take it out to do some more advanced coding, connect an Arduino with, um, if you just want a keyboard that's a physical keyboard, you have it. Um, we have an Apple TV in every single, I think every single room, except this one. I didn't mention this at the beginning. I am um, hiding might be the wrong verb, but it might be the right verb, hiding in a, a network switch closet. This is one of our, nope, I'm mirrored. One of our network switches, uh, fiber comes in. Where's the fiber? Right there, that teal gigabit fiber, very exciting. Um, but nobody 
ever opens these doors. So not only do I have very fast internets, as my mom calls it, she has an S to stuff, internets, um, but I'm also not gonna be interrupted as I record this. And I guess it kind of fits as a background, right? Um, anyway, except for this room, this is a switch closet, uh, just about every building that normal humans would be in, um, there's a TV with an Apple TV connected so that anybody can airplay and wirelessly be able to do that. It's a way to defront the classroom. It's a way to um, make it more equitable so that anyone can airplay if they need to. It's not the teacher in the front of the room and only the teacher hardwired can connect. Uh, it's good stuff. I already talked about the shared laptop carts, if you're following along with the, the points. Um, you talked about, you saw the, the Google site earlier. And one last thing that actually is an interesting way, if we have some older laptops, you know, like for us, that's about five years where it's Mac OS starts to not run super quickly with it. We actually wipe Mac OS, remove it from our Jamf database, uh, and then spin it up as a Chromebook running Chrome OS. Not technically a Chromebook, it runs cloud ready. So if you don't know what to do with some old devices, that's a, that's a pretty fun way to, uh, to continue using them. And we usually get about three more years of life out of it. Because the hardware, my goodness, like an Apple computer, the hardware will last. It's more that the, the software gets to be better than the hardware itself. But with Chrome, it's more life out of it. So as we look at professional development, uh, I've talked about this in a number of ways. I think it, it really overlaps. But in, in this bucket, as we continue to look at the SD standards for administrators, um, I think Apple Teacher is a really cool way to build capacity for teachers. It's another way to connect them with the Apple education team, uh, which I think is really important. Um, it's also a way just to hear about innovative ways to use Apple devices from people that aren't school administrators, right? I think there's some real power in having other experts, um, other amazing people share some great resources. And then another thing that you're seeing again and again is just whenever you can to individualize that experience for everybody, whether it's employees, students, kind of you name it. Um, that's a really important thing. And then the last thing, um, no, not the last. This is the penultimate ESC standard for administrator. There's one after this. It's called digital citizenship. We've rebranded it as digital leadership. Um, and so what that really looks like is having an acceptable use policy that actually makes sense and then actually using it. And then the most exciting thing I think in this bucket is looking at students creating content for other students. So for us, that mostly looks like eighth graders creating videos for younger students, walking them through. So as younger students are learning about how to use devices in a responsible way, um, they're not just learning it from like the adult, from the tech director, from their advisor, from a homeroom teacher. They're also learning it from their older peers, which is pretty rad. Feel free to take that idea. That's a fun one. Um, our last thing is, uh, you know, is looking at, at content knowledge, right? And so as we develop this, you know, it's just trying to open up conferences to all employees, trying to give that autonomy for what you want to learn, where do you want to learn it, um, and then trying to, to build out the budget as um, an admin team so that we can actually fund a variety of professional learning. So um, again, if, if this fits in with your job role, would strongly recommend that. Um, if it doesn't, then you know, advocate for yourself for that. So that again, you have that you know, autonomy and you're creating that culture kind of, of autonomy. So um, the last thing, if you do have questions, you're able to reach out to me on all the things. Um, as my mom would say on the Twitters, feel free to reach out to me. My, if you can spell my name, Bill Selleck, you can find my website, you can find me on Twitter, on Instagram, Bill at Hillbrook org will get you to my email. Uh, please reach out as you have thoughts, as you have questions. And with that, thank you so much for listening to this session.